So let me start recording. Okay, so uh, welcome. Uh, we're gonna uh, start our uh, lecture today. Um, we'll look at uh, some parts that we missed last time, uh, in particular scheduling a cron type of a job using Kubernetes on GKE. And uh, then we'll look at uh, a workflow management tool, uh, in particular Apache Airflow. So those are two things that we uh, that were left from last session. So we're gonna do that first. And then we're gonna look at our today's objective, which is to mostly introduce ourselves to, uh, some of you might have already know this, uh, is to introduce ourselves to more distributed uh, data processing. And we'll rely on the Spark ecosystem um, and we'll get, get some hands-on um, uh, experience with that, okay? So with that, let me um, share my screen. So uh, for the next about, uh, you know, first first one third of the class, maybe we'll try to, uh, or probably less, we'll try to uh, revisit what we did last time uh, and focus on the two things that we did not do. Uh, I think last week, maybe uh, Google Cloud was experiencing some issues, but we'll try to schedule a job on Kubernetes uh, for our, our transient model pipeline that we built last time, and then look at uh, Airflow as a way to, uh, manage again, you know, scheduling this, this type of uh, uh, ML uh, workflow. So let's go to cron jobs. So just to give a recap on the first two parts of this, uh, uh, this section, we were focusing on data science workflows. This was basically a bunch of tasks, some of them sequential, some of them could be uh, could be parallel, uh, and and these collection of tasks were uh, had to be done in in a data science you know workflow process. For example, querying data from somewhere, cleaning the data, uh, you know, uh, prepping the data for uh, for a specific type of model. Uh, for example, in our case, the recommendation system models that we've, we've been building, and then um, after the training is done, uh, you know, dumping the model to a storage space, a storage location, as well as uh, using the model to make predictions. Uh, for example, for the next day or the future. Uh, for a bunch of users, and those predictions again uh, need to be saved in a in a in a storage or a application database. So those were the uh, tasks, and uh, um, we looked at um, um, an example. Uh, let me go to that section. So. We built the task in, in a container. So what was the difference between the, ta the, the a single Python script that we created last time versus uh, you know, the Python scripts that were in like section one, or, 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 you know, the first lecture and so on. The difference is that this container involved uh, basically not a model serving uh, code, but actually a model training code. So it was a transient data pipeline. And I think that I think is mentioned in, in section two. Uh, so transient pipelines is, is, is one where we are gonna rebuild or retrain our model from scratch. So if it's a neural network uh, based uh, uh, you know, pipeline, then you have to have a, a GPU uh, available. And so retraining models from scratch every time, maybe periodically every day or every week, is sometimes be expensive, sometimes, uh, uh, but it has its own benefits, which is that uh, if you, because you're retraining every time you need to generate predictions, it may be closer to it may be using more fresh data, okay? Uh, unlike a persistent model pipeline where the model training is decoupled with uh, making predictions, okay? So if it's decoupled, then maybe you'll update your model every month uh, and whereas you're making predictions every day, uh, then maybe uh, because you only updated the model a month ago, maybe new data has changed or maybe the situation changed. So your, your predictions may be incorrect, in inaccurate, okay? So that's, there's pros and cons for both transient and persistent model pipelines. Um, what we did was uh, use uh, LightFM, which is a different package. So unlike in the first section where we looked at uh, supplies lib, 
and uh, a PyTorch based uh, model for making recommendations, maybe making these movie recommendations. Uh, last time we picked up a slightly different uh, uh, package, uh, but it was actually doing matrix factorization as well. So, um, so um, we picked up this particular package to do to do that to do uh, to train our model, and uh, and and the and the lab and the uh, notebook was slightly modified uh, to so you can download the notebook from uh, the this section, uh, but the notebook was basically um, slightly modified, and the modifications were that um, so let me download the notebook and run it locally just to show you the modifications. Um, <laughs> so I just um, um, downloaded it. So if you look at it, it's basically, uh, you know, so there's a complex operation going on in fetch movie lens, okay? So fetch movie lens is, of course, fetching the same data set every, every time, but you can imagine, uh, you know, address, you know, re requesting from the same resource, but on the resource side, they would change the data that is being, you know, uh, responded back to you. So, so that you don't have to uh, keep changing the URL to get new data, okay? Uh, and, and so, or it could be an access from a database, but in this case, we are getting the data from a URL. Okay, um, so so this would be a separate job in itself in a in a workflow process. But in in this simple example, uh, all the tasks uh, like uh, get, fetching the data and prepping the data is all happening in this single function call. So uh, and, and the data happens to be of this uh, sparse matrix type uh, that that pre processing has already been done. Uh, inside this function call. So if you open that function, it's it's uh, it's a uh, it, it does a lot of uh, subtasks. Okay. So uh, LightFM is the is the name of the uh, package, and you can use loss functions and so on. But it follows, I think, a scikit-learn style um, format. It is a model dot fit where you just pass the tra training data and you specify a few hyperparameters. Uh, so once you train, what we did was uh, create a new function called all recommendations because we were thinking of the transient pipeline as a every time new data like uh, about users and movies interactions uh, is present at the same location every time we fetch that data we train this 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 type of model it's a matrix factorization model and then we produce a recommendation for all the users okay so so that's uh, that's this function that we just added it's quite straightforward uh, once you get the uh, recommendations for every user, so it's uh, so user ID one, two, three, four. These are the recommendations, and uh, when did we make the predictions, for example? Okay. So once we have that, we also included a another function, uh, another library, uh, Pandas uh, Google BigQuery uh, library, which we installed, and from there we were able to push this uh, data frame essentially directly to. Uh, so data frame directly to uh, Google BigQuery, and we saw the example. So let's just go to. Hello. Manji. <laughs> somebody is on not on mute. Uh, okay, so. This is a project, and uh, uh, last time, I mean, basically, we, we created this particular table inside that uh, database, and, and so you can see uh, what are the details, and, and we also saw uh, what the what the predictions look like. Okay, so this is the additional time we additional I guess parts we added to that uh, quick start. Okay, that particular recommendation system uh, model. So let's go back to um, yeah, and. Uh, and then we also had a part where we could also uh, query uh, from the BigQuery uh, database um, or the table that we created. So uh, you can again, so this for this, actually you don't need the Pandas uh, Google BigQuery uh, package. You can actually directly use 
uh, Google Cloud BigQuery uh, package. So there you just uh, connect the client and then you can do SQL query. So select star from uh, you know this database and this table will actually give you the whole, you know, we're retrieving the whole set of predictions. Uh, so you could do that, okay? So that's what we saw in the training uh, workflow. So that's our running example. And we wanted to now next do a couple of things, uh, which is first put the script, which does the training and dump the predictions into this remote location. We wanted to put that into an image so that we can run a container uh, from this image uh, in a periodic manner. And so the first part uh, of last lecture, uh, sorry, uh, in, in last lecture, we did uh, this, this creation of a Docker image. And uh, uh, for that, you know, we had this Jupyter notebook, so we could easily convert the notebook. I mean, we can directly convert the notebook into, uh, uh, you can just do file, download, and, and save as, um, sorry, download as um, Python. And uh, we did that uh, last time. And then uh, you also need to save. Uh, so I also was, uh, uh, so I also created a simple uh, shell uh, script. Uh, which had this export uh, because we need to know where the location of this this service account user is, uh, well, sorry, service account user's credentials are, and and then uh, run the Python uh, uh, file name. This file name has the whole workflow. Ideally, you would have Python uh, get data.py followed by Python you know uh, train my model.py and then Python uh, uh, save my predictions to bigquery.py, but it's all in the same script currently uh, for simplicity um, and so we created this script only because i mean it's just one way to do it it's not the only way to do it in fact this export can also be ha can also be written inside a docker file so we created a docker file from uh, from debian we installed uh, this light fm uh, package for a particular version you can change this and see what what happens you can use the latest version if you want uh, and then copy the relevant files. So the uh, the whole pipeline file, uh, and then our credentials, and then the script which essentially you know sets the environment variable and then calls by it calls uh, uh, our, our 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 training pipeline, okay, transient training pipeline. And the command. So when we when the container starts, it, it's going to just run this. And so you'll see that uh, after 30 seconds or so, the container dies because it's it's done. Unlike a model serving container, which will continue to which ideally should run as a daemon because it has to continue serving the models, uh, serving the predictions, you know, to request uh, till you actually stop the container or kill the container, right? Uh, so there's a difference there. Uh, so we built a container with Docker image build with a tag recommended scope pipeline uh, locally. So, uh, any questions? Okay, uh, so we built a container locally. Next, uh, what we did uh, is to schedule, uh, we didn't schedule uh, the container itself, but we were talking about, we, we discussed a little bit more about cron. Okay, cron is a really old, uh, but uh, stable and very versatile tool for scheduling jobs on local machines. Uh, and, and it's been there since a long time. Um, and, and the way to access this a cron daemon is through cron, cron tab. Cron tab uh, will let you define task specifications of when a task has to be repeatedly uh, run. A task is like a, a program or essentially our pipeline, for example. Uh, and uh, uh, and so we were just talking about this, uh, the syntax of a cron tab specification, so of, of a uh, cron job specification. Uh, and so it's basically uh, essentially five numbers followed by the path to the command and, our, you know, and, and, and arguments to the command if needed. So those five numbers um, with, with occasional changes with, with some special characters being you know, star. Uh, so these special characters here, um, they essentially tell you how the scheduling happens. For example, if the first two numbers are um, you know, 12 and 14 and the last three numbers or the locations of the numbers, there's just star, then it just says star just means every uh, often. Okay, and, and the first number is supposed to represent the uh, minute, second number has to represent the hour of the day, third number for uh, day of the month, uh, fourth number uh, for the month itself, and fifth number for which which big date is. And so you you know there were a lot of uh, you know a lot of variations that you can come up with depending on when you want to schedule. For example, if you want to run something on uh, on 2 p.m. a 12th minute of 2 p.m. every uh, fifth and uh, seventh. Uh, uh, Date. 
so fifth and seventh day of each month, then you could you could have a, a specification like this. But once you specify this, uh, we um, we can you know once you specify this in the cron tab and, and and exit, then it's it's it just starts and runs this command every you know at the time specified. So we did that example last time. Uh, you can remove the uh, uh, specifications by doing minus r. Uh, all the all the specifications in the in your cron tab. Uh, uh, in your cron, uh, in your task list, um, and and uh, if you want to he help with semantics, we looked at uh, a couple of uh, links to uh, help us, you know, uh, say, you know, uh, help us with writing the proper task specification. So that's what we did uh, towards the end. And then uh, what we wanted to do was to run the uh, same type of a scheduling job on the cloud. And the choice that we made was to use uh, Kubernetes. Uh, to do so, uh, and our job is actually the transient uh, task pipeline, transient model pipeline. We created a Docker image at the beginning of the section. So we're gonna push the Docker image to uh, Google Container Registry, and then use GKE to set up a Kubernetes cluster, which would use that uh, image to create containers uh, and run our pipeline every, you know, uh, I think in our case, uh, every minute. If, uh, We'll just double check that. So that's where we were last time. Uh, and I think last time what we did was was to be able to push this uh, Docker image to uh, Google Container Registry. And that required a few commands. And we've seen this uh, pushing a Docker image to uh, Container Registry before because while, while serving models, uh, we also had to do the same thing. So basically it requires um, uh, a Docker logging into uh, your Google uh, you know, using your Google credentials, so it, it's able to push the image to your uh, uh, to the uh, container registry, and and then you also need to properly tag your uh, image. Uh, so so at, at the appropriate URL with the appropriate project uh, ID, um, and 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 then you just do Docker Docker push of that particular uh, repository, and then you uh, you get the image. I think uh, if I recall correctly. Um, We have this recommended underscore pipeline there. Yeah, we have. Uh, there were two versions, but uh, recommended underscore pipeline is the is the is the image, and even the other one is the same thing. Um, so we did that. Okay, and and what we, what is useful for us is uh, when we create our GKE uh, or the our Kubernetes cluster, we'll need this. Uh, in particular, this whole URL, okay? So this uh, USTCR, uh, dot io and so on. So let me copy that and keep it somewhere for now. Um, let's come back here. So, uh, okay, so now, <laughs> Uh, let's actually uh, create a cluster. So let me do that. And you'll also see how to use uh, a, a Google shell. So I think last time when we deployed a container on Kubernetes, uh, although on the local machine we were using kubectl and minikube, uh, when we created a when we created a Kubernetes cluster, we just used a uh, I guess a quick start uh, style process. So we were not really uh, specifying anything other than the container location. Okay, last time. Uh, so instead of that, uh, this time we'll use kubectl uh, and also Google Cloud Shell. Cloud Shell is just a uh, I guess a terminal for you to uh, you know use kubectl uh, utility to uh, direct or manage this Kubernetes cluster. So let's do that. Um, okay, so this time we're going to do create cluster, <laughs> and you'll see uh, a lot of options. Uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll, we'll again take a somewhat of a shortcut. We're going to use, you know, uh, my first cluster option here towards the right. 
what it does is uh, just change the underlying uh, instance. So we'll use something called a G1 small instance, uh, a computer instance instead of an E2 medium instance. And, and also some specifications are, are lower, okay? But otherwise, uh, it's essentially a Kubernetes cluster. So let's see. Uh, Yeah, so I, I don't think there was anything to customize. So let's create the cluster. So any questions about uh, Kubernetes uh, because we, we're revisiting the topic? So there are many ways to schedule our job uh, on Kubernetes. I mean, in particular, our trans, you know, transient model pipeline. Uh, what we've done so far is create an image, right? So therefore, there's going to be a single container on our Kubernetes cluster, uh, which is fine. Uh, but if you had multiple jobs, like the data fetching job, and then a training job, and then an uploading predictions job, uh, then maybe those, those three will be separate containers. Uh, there has to be some persistent storage from which they'll read and write, like the data querying will query the data, prepare the data and dump it somewhere, maybe on S3 or Google st Cloud Storage. And, and then the training uh, job or the training uh, container will read from there, train and dump the model and the uh, dump the model to this, uh, from again, uh, Google Cloud Storage. And then from there you'll read and, and make predictions, for example. You can make it into a three-part process. So let's... Uh, And uh, scheduling, we, what we'll do is uh, this time we'll use uh, uh, a YAML file. We have seen a YAML file last time uh, when we're creating a, a Kubernetes uh, cluster uh, on, a, when, on Minikube. We use a YAML file because we had to change some settings so that the uh, cluster deployment uh, specification could, uh, you know, could reference the local uh, Minikube uh, uh, image uh, so Minikube container repository rather than trying to pull the pull the image from somewhere else. Okay, so we had to add some additional tags in our in, so and so we created a YAML file and and then we did that. Okay, so we're gonna do something similar this time. I don't know. Uh, it is taking some time to create a. Cluster. Okay, so it says uh, total cores, uh, cluster size is three, total number of cores is uh, three virtual CPUs. So let's uh, connect, which is a button towards the right. And, uh, and it says, okay, connect with the cluster, you can actually do uh, use kubectl, and that's what we're gonna do. So uh, we can run this command in the cloud shell. So the command is already given here. So instead of, uh, uh, running locally, let's run it in the cloud shell. So let's, let's click that. So what it does is let's uh, uh, kubectl know the, uh, know, the, know the cluster. I mean, uh, access and therefore control the cluster. So this actually cloud shell itself runs on another machine, but the machine uh, accesses <laughs> Uh, I think it's not, you, you don't get charged. Okay. So we have that command. So uh, get credentials, essentially uh, trying to get the credentials for us to control this cluster. It's just called my, plus, my first cluster hyphen one. Uh, uh, and zone and the project name and so on. So let's uh, hit enter. 
and says uh, gcloud is requesting your credentials to make a api call so you need this uh, you need to authorize this uh, so let's click authorize uh, and so it says uh, fetching cluster endpoint and auth auth data and, and basically you need to be able to uh, 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 you know if, if you're running it for the first time maybe you'll have to open a browser and, and uh, do an oauth style authentication but uh, it's it's quite straightforward so then you can look at uh, cube ctl uh, like let's say if you, if you type get all you will see that there is actually a cluster instance of some local ip uh, present yeah so this is the cluster ip and so we have access to a cluster now so now all we need to do is uh, do a deployment on this cluster with a deployment specification and the specification we're going to do using a yaml file okay uh, and we've seen yaml files before uh, so let me just uh, do this and maybe okay i actually have a yaml file here uh, from before so 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 what you had to do was to create, uh, actually let me do this, Vim uh, recommend pipeline. Was an, is, you can give a, any name to the YAML file. I think, uh, so this is the YAML file. It's basically a bunch of key values, keys and values, uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, sensitive to uh, the indenting. Okay, so two uh, spaces um, uh, indentation. So you can see, I think the thing what we need to focus on is uh, uh, the kind tag and then the schedule tag. So in the spec, uh, there's a schedule tag or a schedule key, uh, and you can see that it has five stars here. here. Just means that run this uh, program every uh, minute. Okay, so every minute, every day, every, every hour, every day of the month and so on. Okay, and if you go back to uh, the spec, in terms of containers, it's just uh, the name is called recommend hyphen containers. Um, so the name doesn't matter. So you can give any name, but just give a name which doesn't have underscores and so on. Um, and then the image location is this us us dot um, So so this is the image location that we have. Okay, uh, where we have uploaded our training a transient training pipeline image, and then we start policy on failure. It's some default uh, policy. So, so the only change is this uh, key uh, line is this. So, uh, line number six. Okay, and uh, now I'm using a particular editor in in this terminal. Uh, it's Vim. Uh, it's good to know the basic uh, commands to work with Vim. So you can see that. Uh, so uh, I'm okay. So I can edit it by pressing I. Okay. So, um, so, so let's go here. So if I if I press I, it's in insert mode. It's sorry, it's it was already in insert mode. Um, so insert mode is shown at the bottom. It says insert, so I can write uh, something. Uh, and if I want to get out of insert mode, I just uh, sorry. Uh, I just press. Uh, I just press escape. Okay. Uh, navigation is once you are not in insert mode, you can navigate uh, easily. And uh, I guess the most important thing is to get in and out of insert mode, uh, deleting and, and jumping across lines. There are a lot of shortcuts, but it's, uh, I guess uh, you guys can refer to it later. Uh, and, and once you have made the desired edit edits, then you can do escape, uh, shift uh, uh, colon. Uh, you can see at the bottom, I guess bottom left, uh, there's a colon sign. And, and then if you want to write and quit, you can do WQ. If you're not happy with the edits and you want to just uh, exit without saving, then you can do quit and then a exclamation mark. Okay, so let's let's just do quit and exclamation mark. Um, so that's the uh, YAML file that we have. Now to deploy it, uh, we have already seen how to deploy a YAML file before. So it's just uh, kubectl minus f. Uh, sorry, kubectl uh, deploy minus f. Yeah, so let me double check the command before I run that. Uh, yeah, sorry, it keeps it apply minus f. So, so you can see that, so first let's see before and after what happens. So get all, gets all resources available for you to control. So right now the, class, the cluster is instantiated, but you have not done anything, okay? There's no reference to parts or uh, nodes or anything like that. Uh, now let's actually, 
uh, apply minus f is f for the file and then recommend uh, pipeline uh, so it says uh, uh, the deployment uh, was created okay so from the deployment specification we created a deployment uh, and then we can do get all you can see a type uh, so there is a, a name uh, for this deployment uh, and you know the schedule is this and suspend is false it's not yet active uh, so you can see that so you can actually go to workload uh, since we just created a deployment okay it already started maybe you know if, if i clicked it earlier you would have seen it's uh, still prepare, preparing okay so you can go back here uh, uh, So let me see, say status okay, but uh, so that uh, it should show me the, oh yeah, okay. So what I was looking for was the uh, container itself. So I think what happened from this claim, uh, so you can see that uh, it is not yet active. So it was zero uh, uh, of, of this deployment to it is actually uh, provisioning right so this is actually matching container so matching the container to uh, container to the node okay so there's a three node cluster that will match a container to one of the nodes uh, and 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 uh, uh, and you can see the uh, uh, the pod name here and, uh, and and the job name. So you will see that because of the schedule, the, so what's happening every minute, the container is getting started, sorry, uh, from the image, a container is getting started, it trains, it dumps uh, data to BigQuery and it dies, okay? So you will see that uh, the container is sometimes status is ready, sometimes the status is uh, not ready and so on, okay? So we just ran this. So ideally there should be a timestamp on our dumped predictions in BigQuery uh, around this time. So let's, uh, Let's go to BigQuery. Okay. Let's go to authentic ring. And this is the reference. Let me just push it up. Um, Okay, we are looking at this table. So let's look at its details. Uh, so this was, okay, actually if we preview, we are anyway adding the uh, time. So the time is um, today, actually it's uh, tomorrow because I think it may be UTC. Oh no, it's, it's uh, 12, so plus five. So yeah, it's a uh, UTC time being uh, stamped here, but uh, it's okay. So maybe this will change to, what did it say, zero, zero, uh, zero, 007. So if I refresh this in a minute, you'll see zero, 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 0008, okay? So we are writing the predictions every minute. And that frequency is not needed for this type of a job, but uh, it's just to for us to see that the whole thing is, is running fine. Uh, yeah, and I think, uh, so let me actually open another <laughs> console. I mean, the, the Google UI. And let's go back to Kubernetes uh, cluster and, and see, uh, you'll see uh, scheduling related activities uh, being shown in the, in the clusters uh, page. So, let's go here. Let's go to workloads and let's uh, click on this deployment and let's look at events. Okay, so you will see uh, since the time a few minutes ago that we started, uh, it, it finished the job. So I think it's taking about 50 seconds to finish the job. Um, and then again, 
another job was created again finished it uh, and so on so it's it's doing um, doing the same thing uh, over and over again uh, Yeah, and also if I go back to uh, my BigQuery, uh, you'll see that it's not going to be, if I refresh this, it's not going to be um, 0 0.7 anymore. Let me just do that. But I think I lost the uh, um, cloud shell. That's okay. Um, So it became zero nine. So I think it got refreshed a couple of times. Uh, so so that's the uh, that's what we wanted to accomplish. Okay. So this you would not run it at every minute, but you would do it uh, every uh, nightly or every uh, week uh, at a given time uh, in in a professional organization. Uh, any questions about this part? Before I um, so since I closed uh, uh, Google Cloud Shell, I can't do. Kubectl delete the you know deployment, uh, but I'm just going to use uh, the UI to uh, uh, delete the deployment. Any questions in the meantime? Um, one quick question: uh, if, Can we not use uh, without? Uh, can we not deploy without the YAML file here? Um, just uh, create a deployment package since you're already using the cloud shell and uh, you're in the GCP. I mean, the YAML was on, yeah, we can actually, yeah, so YAML is not needed. That's just one way. So I think uh, YAML was just to show you how to uh, specify the uh, schedule. Uh, you can actually do the workload uh, scheduling uh, using the UI as well. Okay, so once the workload is there, you can actually change the properties and, and specify that it has to run every X minutes. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, and I just deleted the workload, so now there is no workload. Uh, so, uh, but yeah, so that's that's what I wanted to demonstrate. I just wanted to show YAML because it's all it's it's a little bit more programmable. So, okay. Of course, it will become more unwieldy the more the YAML file grows, uh, actually. But at the same time, it's a little bit more uh, easy to uh, work with, uh, you know, programmatically. Okay. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to delete this. Uh, do we need this? Um, I don't think we need this, so I'm going to delete this cluster. Um, okay, so let's go back uh, to yeah. So that's that's about scheduling on the cloud. I mean, so it was a very simple scheduling. Uh, but uh, let's now go to another topic, uh, very related to this, where uh, which can do a much better job with uh, workflow, workflow scheduling and automation. And that's uh, Apache. Uh, so we're going to we're going to look at a specific workflow management tool. So Kubernetes by itself is not a workflow management tool. There is some nice scheduling prop, scheduling aspects that you can bring in when you def, de, define a deployment. Uh, but uh, uh, there are actually specialized tools which can work with Kubernetes uh, for you to manage your uh, tasks and task schedules and task dependencies. Okay, so there may be an upstream task uh, whose output your task depends on, and there could be a downstream task which depends on your uh, task output. So all that uh, uh, becomes quite uh, difficult to manage if you if you're going to do it with a uh, with cron. Cron first of all is is machine specific. Um, uh, uh, and, and Kubernetes uh, schedules are one way, but you'll see another way to do it, uh, which is which is uh, using a workflow management tool. So let me uh, use that. Uh, let me start with that. So, uh, what is the I guess what's the uh, challenge now? I mean, we already saw a cron based scheduling, uh, but as I mentioned just now, it becomes harder to manage if uh, some jobs fail. For example, maybe your data fetching, new fresh data fetching job failed because somebody you know, uh, you know, because of some misconfiguration of the database uh, from which you're supposed to fetch, or uh, or maybe it went offline for the few moments when you're actually trying to fetch, uh, and so on. Right. So if 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 something fails, then uh, there has to be a nicer way to uh, interrupt 
and and uh, take over okay so uh, workflow tools like and the one we are going to look at is called airflow uh, help resolving uh, dependencies capturing dependencies and resolving dependencies in case of errors uh, between uh, the tasks okay um, and uh, uh, such airflow, such uh, workflow tools, uh, we've already discussed uh, the generality of workflow tools, uh, but uh, workflow tools also allow for version control beyond just the code. The whole process can be version controlled as well. Uh, and uh, uh, there are other, other capabilities of such tools uh, that you will, you will come across in your professional uh, uh, environments. For example, uh, such tools can also alert the corresponding task owner so for example, somebody, you know, a data engineer is responsible for a fresh batch of data every, every night. Uh, and if the task fails, they, get, they will get immediately alerted and, and so they can look into it, okay? Um, and they can actually not just look into it, but also run the task so that, uh, you know, run the task manually so that the whole uh, pipeline, you know, is you know, continues to work. Uh, and it's logged appropriately in the, in the, in the workflow management tool. So, if, if, if people use the same type of tools, for example, Airflow, then a lot of different tasks, a lot of different jobs, uh, not just our training pipeline uh, that we had, uh, but also ETL jobs, uh, as well as, uh, you know, reporting, job, reporting jobs, as in, you know, things which uh, analysts produce, uh, uh, all those can be tracked and, and scheduled to run at uh, appropriate times in, in, under the same uh, environment, okay, and under the same, I guess, um, management uh, tool. And we'll go through one of the tools. There are actually several tools that are listed in the first page. Uh, if, I, if I go back to the uh, data science workflows, uh, you'll see uh, I've, I've listed MLflow, uh, and maybe we'll catch the glimpse of MLflow uh, later today. Uh, Qflow, Argo, uh, Luigi, and so on. So there are many tools. Uh, but we'll focus on Airflow because the general ideas are the same. And Airflow lets us work with um, Python, and I think uh, some of the others will also probably let, let you work with Python. Uh, so, uh, but let's focus on Airflow for now as a running uh, example of a workflow tool. So what's Airflow? Airflow is a uh, workflow, workflow tool, which means that it lets us manage and schedule just like Cron, just think of it as a more uh, professional and, 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 and uh, more, I guess, uh, feature rich version, uh, which can schedule and monitor and, and log and so on. Uh, so it's scalable. So it's not specific to a single machine like Cron. So you can actually uh, work with the cluster, like a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, it's actually uh, Airflow. You can also you can define the uh, workflow or the whole uh, task sequence as the graph. Okay. In particular, we'll define it as a uh, as a uh, directed acyclic graph in uh, in Python itself. So so the definition of uh, of the task and its dependencies are the overall uh, you know pipeline uh, in in python is is nice so it's it's programmable in that way and uh, uh, and so those are the couple of features and there are other features extensible like elegance and so on so that i just got from airflow web page um, so a key benefit for us is that it allows us to describe uh, ml pipelines okay and that's so airflow can be used for other pipelines maybe there are some other software engineering and other uh, not just software engineering, business process also being tracked there, right? Uh, but that's uh, not our focus. Um, so let's uh, get started with Airflow, start uh, working with a simple um, example. So, um, so what are the basics, right? So Airflow works with graphs, okay? Graphs are the uh, basic objects and uh, these graphs represent tasks, okay? So they are not actually the tasks themselves, but just talking about how the tasks relate to each other. Can describe in particular since they are acyclic and directed graphs, they talk about which task can lead to which other task. Okay, and so each node is a task with incoming arrows uh, from other tasks, implying that those tasks are upstream uh, dependencies. Okay, uh, so we can let's install uh, uh, Airflow actually locally uh, for now. So let's uh, go to Airflow's. Uh, uh, page installation uh, on I'm on Mac right so let's see um, yeah we just want to install airflow so actually we can just do um, 
uh, forget about constraints. Uh, we'll just install uh, pip install airflow. So um, actually, okay. So we are in the right environment. So I started this uh, Jupyter notebook in under the data sci conda environment. So um, so let's do pip install. Okay, uh, what is the command? Apache hyphen airflow. Maybe there's also conda based installation. I didn't uh, check. Uh, okay. Uh, it install. I think I, uh, the formatting is messed up because of the screen size. Uh, let's go. Uh, let's go here. Uh, yeah, let's actually uh, check. So, so before I, I check, you know, so actually it's written here. Uh, so before I check, let me export a location for where I want to store Airflow files. Um, it may be useful to do this uh, just to keep everything. I think by default itself, uh, I think by default it will consider that particular folder in in your user directory on Mac and Linux. So, but anyway, uh, just to be uh, safe, uh, let's do that. So. So if you want to check if it actually set, so you can just check and it is at uh, Airflow. So uh, next, uh, we'll do a succession, a succession of three commands and I'm going to explain what we're doing. So Airflow is a workflow management tool. To manage uh, you know, your, your workflows or tasks, uh, it has to store all the metadata, all the information about these tasks, their failure states, you know, when they fail, when were they scheduled, what happened before, and so on, somewhere, right? So we're going to use a database to do that. Uh, by default, uh, you know, if you do a local install like this, uh, it will store it in a SQLite database, okay? But you can change the uh, database from SQLite to MySQL server or, uh, you know, Postgres uh, or something else. Uh, but uh, let's first create a uh, database. Um, then what we'll do is uh, <laughs> do two things. One is uh, start a web server. So a uh, web server is just for us to uh, access uh, Apache Airflow UI through the web, uh, through the, through a browser. And we'll also start the key, uh, I guess, uh, program, which is the uh, Airflow scheduler. Okay, the scheduler is the one which will actually uh, schedule. You know, is like the like the cron uh, daemon. Okay, so um, Airflow web server find sport. Let's use ATAD and. Since it's a web server, it'll continue to run. Uh, let me actually open a uh, new terminal. Oh, new notebook. No. Uh, Okay, so here let's try Airflow Scheduler. Okay, so I think the scheduler is running. So now let's look at, okay, there's a lot of log information here, uh, but we just have to go to this uh, local IP. Okay. Okay, so this is the default interface and you may say, oh, okay, what is going on here? So basically this is the uh, bunch of tasks. These are all example uh, tasks that are already available on this, uh, on the Airflow interface. Uh, for example, that's, you know, so these are DAGs. Okay, you can see the column name, it, it says it's a DAG. And on the second column it shows, uh, so first column is actually showing whether and it's active or not. So, uh, so these are all paused. You can see it's off state, and uh, and then the schedule itself. So you can see zero zero a star 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 means run it at every zero minute 
of the zeroth hour. So every midnight, run this particular example, right? Uh, on every day, every month, uh, every day of every month, uh, and so on. Okay. So and and it and, and the next few columns just show uh, when were the recent tasks performed, and and there are a lot of links uh, related to that. So actually, let's. Uh, uh, we can click on any one of them. So I'm just thinking, what's that? So let me click on example bash operator uh, just to see uh, the interface. So let's, uh, so that's gonna describe to us uh, what the DAG looks like. So if you look at, uh, so we are looking at the tree view. So it's a bunch of nodes and a bunch of uh, edges related to it. Let's actually change the view to uh, a, a the graph view. Uh, let's go to graph view. I mean, we're going to get into the details of what is this DAG about. I mean, I'm just right now. I'm just exploring, and and uh, click. I clicked on a particular uh, DAG example. Okay, so here it says. Uh, so this is the actual, uh, you know, the, the graph uh, of this uh, uh, DAG or this this workflow. So it says uh, run me zero, run me one, so run me two. After all these three uh, tasks get completed, uh, run something else. Run after the loop, and then you run something else, and then run this last. So. It looks like there's some simple, you know, since this example, uh, there's a bunch of dependencies here. Um, and uh, let's look let's look at the code itself. Uh, so we can, so I just, so by default it opened the tree view, uh, but I clicked on a graph view, which gave me something like this, but let's understand uh, what we're trying to do here. So this, this, web, this page is just an interface for a bunch of uh, DAGs, okay? So if I click on DAGs, uh, so that's the default page homepage and, and it will show me a bunch of DAGs, okay? So these all each DAG corresponds to a bunch of tasks, okay? There are a lot of tasks in examples, but uh, each one corresponds to a bunch of tasks uh, that need to be executed in a certain way at certain times. So this is executing uh, every night, uh, midnight, right? So I clicked on it and uh, it showed me the task dependency in the tree view as well as the uh, uh, graph view. Okay, uh, so for example, you can see run me zero is run and then run me after loop is run and then run this last is run. Run me one is run and then after loop is run and that's it. So, uh, and, and they have some dependencies. So this is this is the view of this, these tasks. Okay, now let's go back to uh, the same, uh, you know, this dependency of task, uh, we can see uh, under the code tab. So let me click on the code. Um, Yeah. So, so before I, I get into the code, let me come back to uh, uh, what is this? So let's close this. So let me come back to. Uh, so, so we, we are at this point where we open the uh, uh, UI. So the web server was showing us what tasks are available and what have what what's going on. Uh, we can also go into uh, our directory. So if you go to the Airflow directory, so uh, okay, here we are running the scheduler here we are running the uh, web ui so let's actually go to um, uh, so this one we don't need at this point let's close it and another let's open another terminal and let's actually go to cd airflow so this is the uh, oh, no uh, Okay, this is actually desktop, CD Airflow. So you'll see that uh, there's a, there's, this is the DB, the SQLite DB uh, that's going on, uh, that was created. Uh, and, and then this is the configuration file. So it's actually, a, if you do a word count of this Airflow config file, it's quite a few lines long. So let's not open it, but uh, uh, yeah, so, so what, so just to recap what we did so far, we created a database, uh, initialized database, sorry. And then we started the scheduler and started the web server. The scheduler is the one which actually gets the tasks running, uh, like cron, like to so actually run the command for the task so that it executes on, on the machine or a single machine or, or, or in a cluster. And then the web server is just to show us what's the state of the status of the tasks. Okay, now let's go back here. So before I get into the, the code of that example, as well as in our case, our uh, task, um, um, like transient pipeline example, 
uh, let's uh, understand what a workflow specification looks like for 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 the airflow uh, uh, the, you know for an airflow from an airflow perspective so the key idea is we need to essentially create a file okay an additional auxiliary file so we already had our training transient training pipeline file we create another file which is the um, uh, uh, which is an auxiliary file which is which specifies the workflow okay so it's a python file so uh, and then uh, we'll we'll create a so uh, we'll so there are different ways to start the task so it's a python file at, at you know and it's and it's specifying the workflow so it has to specify uh, what commands to run right so you know each each task could be a command like python file name dot py python you know, get data dot py right so there are different um, uh, i guess classes or objects we can use to uh, get uh, get uh, uh, airflow get the scheduler to run these commands okay uh, so one of them is called bash operator and we'll see uh, its example pretty soon uh, so so the in our specification it's a python file where we have to import uh, one of these bash operator or one of these uh, helper uh, i guess objects and they will be able to uh, you know actually execute uh, the command for example in our case it will be docker run recommend underscore pipeline Okay, that's the uh, uh, image that we created uh, to run our uh, getting data, training, and uh, sending models, so sending predictions to BigQuery uh, image, right? Uh, so, um, uh, and, 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 and so that's what we need to do. So in the Python specification, we just have to do, use bash operator or other operators to define which commands to run. And we also specify in which order they're run, okay? And uh, there are also additional parameters like uh, who's the owner of this particular whole workflow, uh, and if they need to be alerted by alerted by email, okay, uh, or uh, you know email or I don't know if this one. <laughs> uh, and we can also create. Uh, so we need to. So we specified. Um, we specified the command. Uh, we specified a bash operator uh, object which interfaces uh, to get to get us to run a command like Docker run something. But we also need to specify a uh, a, a DAG uh, class. Okay, so it's a it's an it's an instance of a DAG class where we specify uh, the ordering of these uh, operators or specify the ordering of these tasks. Okay. So we'll we'll see that in the in the example. So uh, or in particular, okay, we're we're thinking of going through the tutorial example, not the uh, uh, bash operator. So let's sorry, not the uh, yeah example bash operator. So let's actually go here uh, instead of this example let's look at a different example uh, but it's the same idea let's go uh, to the main page and go down and tutorial is right here okay so again when i click on tutorial it showed me a tree view uh, but uh, we can look at the graph view to see how many tasks there are uh, it probably Oh, it has a three task print date, sleep, and something called templated. Okay, so if you go to the code, so this is the auxiliary Python file that that uh, you know one additional file that you need to create in addition to your task specific Python files, for example. So uh, there's some standard import. So what uh, the key import here is from Airflow import DAG, and also uh, import an operator. Uh, called bash operator. This is the one where you, which will actually let you run the bash, you know, let's say a command from the command line. Okay. And, uh, and so there are some default things that you need to specify. Uh, so this is like a para parameters dictionary, which will be passed on when you create a, an object from the stack, stack class. So here it's just saying who's the owner, uh, when's the start date, uh, what's the email address and so on. Okay. So here we are actually, uh, creating an object from this DAG class. So we're giving a name, uh, these bunch of default parameters, some description, and, and, and the schedule interval. So this is uh, uh, where you're specifying the schedule. And then, uh, so that's the DAG. And now we're gonna add, uh, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, and then we create uh, individual tasks and attach it to the DAG. And the way we do it is to, for example, task one is created using bash operator. It tells us what the uh, task uh, you know, ID is uh, and what the command is. The command here is a simple command called date. 
and then it and it says which DAG it, it, it's related to, and, and that's the DAG that we created here. Okay, this object is being passed as input here. And similarly, task two is the sleep command, sleep for five seconds, and it's again attached to the uh, same uh, DAG, okay, and, and there are some additional parameters that you can give. And uh, I don't think this task three is very important, uh, but it's just saying, uh, it's, it's, okay, let's not worry about task three. It's just a, um, so this is the uh, task three specification. It's another, uh, you know, sorry, this is another task uh, that is being specified. So, uh, so we have task specification somehow, and we'll see a more concrete example uh, for our situation soon. Um, so, so if you want to run this task, okay, so this task is specified and it's currently off, right? So it's off. So if, uh, and actually let's go back to the main page to figure out. Uh, so the schedule was, um, uh, let's see, tutorial. So, schedule was one day. Okay, so I don't exactly interpret that. Uh, I don't know how to interpret that, but Okay, so we can run this task uh, out of sync, right? So we can actually run this task manually by just clicking here, uh, trigger DAG, okay? Uh, but we'll do that on the command line, just to uh, give an example. So if I want to run this uh, task, okay, uh, with a starting date and an ending date. So this is just a fictitious, uh, I guess, uh, it's just that this task did not run, maybe there are some things errored out and the underlying task, you know, underlying commands. I want to run it for these three days. Okay, so this is called a backfill operation. So we, you are actually running tasks which were supposed to run before and somehow did not run. Um, so you can see there's a, um, I'm, I'm just specifying it to run from 20th to 22nd, so it's, it's in the past. Um, so let's say if, if I click, uh, so if, if I start this uh, run, so it's gonna do those, um, uh, uh, it's going to run the tutorial task, uh, sorry, tutorial DAG, which has those uh, three tasks, right? Print, um, sleep, and, and then template it. It's going to run it uh, for, for those three days, 20th, 21st, and 22nd, and it'll terminate. So while it's running, uh, let's actually go to, I mean, it's running as an, it's, it's running this, this, this task, tutorial task three times. Okay, so let's go back to our Airflow DAG and pick tutorial. Actually, uh, let's go to instances. Okay, so actually you can see that here. So, so maybe you should zoom. Um, okay, I think a better way to see it is um, to go to browse and task instances. So task instances is the one which logs, you know, uh, what tasks have been done before. So, so you can see uh, here what's been scheduled and what's, what's happening. So this DAG, tutorial DAG, had three tasks. Task one, task two, task three. Task one was a print task. Uh, it just finished. Uh, and it's still scheduled the template task and a sleep, sleep task, which is supposed to happen after this. And, and these are all queued, okay? These are all uh, uh, tasks which have to happen. So if I um, refresh this um, page, I think maybe a couple of tasks more might have finished. Um, and so you can monitor the status of, of what's happening. In, 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 so this tutorial had to, tutorial DAG had to run three times in, in the past, okay? So um, it's showing the 21st day task is done, 20th is done, and, and 20 second is, uh, is, is, is going to happen soon. Okay, so that's how you monitor tasks. Um, okay, so that's uh, the tutorial task. I think uh, it's a good uh, uh, exercise to go through these example uh, scripts, that example, Um, example tasks or uh, example DAGs that are listed in the uh, in the Airflow uh, by default. So why does it say queued here? Uh, but uh, let's come back to uh, okay. This is still running. Uh, with the print sleep and templated. Okay. So let's. What we'll do is uh, uh, we'll run our local Docker. Uh, 
task. Uh, so uh, I'll, we'll, we'll create a DAG uh, which will run our uh, local recommend pipeline, the transient pipeline, and, uh, and, and we'll see how that works. Okay. So to do so, uh, we will have to specify our DAG somewhere. So the default directory is actually uh, so this is the server scheduler and here the task is still running okay so let's uh, uh, okay, let me open another terminal so if i go to the airflow directory uh, there is no directory called DAGs, but that's the default directory where you can specify the uh, specify a DAG. So let me make directory uh, DAG, uh, actually DAGs, and then go to the DAGs directory. And then uh, what I'm going to do is um, uh, on the course web page there is a link to our um, the task that we care about. So let me download that and copy that into that folder. Uh, airflow, and I'm gonna copy it into this folder. So this is the DAX folder. And uh, if you, <laughs> Since I copied it here, uh, the scheduler as well as the web server should automatically pick up the DAG that I, uh, the DAG specification file that I've written here. Uh, I've copied it here, and we'll go through the code very quickly. And it's a, it's a small it's a smaller code than the tutorial, so uh, we'll have uh, we'll have a look at it. So let's see if. Uh, okay, on this. No, I think I need to write close. Okay. Okay, so it has not yet been listed here. Um. So you can see the status of uh, tasks being run and, and uh, so on. But let's see. Um, the comment has not appeared yet. Okay, so maybe it'll appear in a few moments. Uh, in the meantime, I wanted to uh, Show you how the uh, the uh, the code looks like. So, um, okay. So you can see, uh, uh, you know, this, so the main component is essentially from Airflow importing a DAG and from Airflow impor importing uh, the bash operator. Okay, so those are the main two things. I don't think this additional stuff is needed. Um, and then there is a default arguments. Uh, so here I did not change anything uh, from from before. Uh, so the more most important parts of the code are basically the DAG and the task specification. So, so DAG is just, uh, I gave it a name with default arguments and, uh, and and the schedule interval is time delta every day. I think this is what it means. Uh, and then the the single task, there's, there's only one task here, is just uh, instantiated using bash operator and the task, you know, I've given it a name, uh, but the task command itself is docker run recommend underscore pipeline. So that's it. So we have a single image. We just want to contain, run the container from this image every uh, every day, okay, every uh, uh, daily, and uh, and that's it. So that's the task uh, specification. Uh, it's attached to this DAG, and 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 there's no and, and there's a I've added an extra field called doc uh, markdown, which just says what does it do. Okay, it just downloads the movie lens data, trains recommendation model, and saves the uh, recommendations to Google BigQuery. Okay, so that's the uh, 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 DAG. Now, if you go back to the DAG,
Okay, it is not yet uh, listed here. Uh, it should automatically pick up from that directory. Okay, I think uh, I've captured that in the uh, in the section saying uh, run airflow underscore list underscore dax. Uh, so let's do that. Yeah, here it's, it's shown as recommended happen pipeline. So uh, it should ideally reflect here. <laughs> okay, somehow the web UI is, is slow to pick that up. Uh, uh, but uh, anyway, so the, the DAG is here. So we can run, uh, the DAG, uh, for example, uh, using the similar command that we ran before. So, uh, sorry. So for tutorial, we ran a uh, uh, command, right? So we can just use the same uh, command to run this. So. Uh, recommend pipelines, get some start date, 2020, 09, 2009, end date of 2020, 09, 2009. So same day, so uh, we can do this and press enter. So let's see if it eventually ended up here. Oh, this, uh, this has not yet updated. So let's... Um, okay, so but it's, it's being shown here, but not in the main dark page, but uh, we just queued it. So, um, so if you click on the task, um, so click on the tag. So that task has, that tag has only one task, which is Docker pipeline run, run task. Uh, and I mean, so okay, I'm not going to do this, but um, the code which you just described when it's also on the our, our, our section is uh, basically run that single task. Okay, so the single task is just run Docker run uh, uh, recommend pipeline. Uh, and that's it. And that's the whole specification. So, but you can imagine there's going to be multiple tasks, T1, T2, T3, T4, and you may have to run one before the other. And so the order can be specified uh, below. So I haven't specified it because there's only one task, but you can specify the ordering that T1 should proceed uh, T2, which could be uh, dumping the, sorry, saving the predictions to uh, Google BigQuery, for example. It could be a separate task and that has to happen after T1. So uh, you can specify that. Um, so let's actually uh, go back and uh, look at task instances to see if it, it triggered because it's, uh, I wanna see if it's on uh, BigQuery or not. Okay, so it actually succeeded. Uh, and okay, so it succeeded. Now let's just, you know, so, so there's a lot more log. I'm not gonna get into a lot of details uh, here. Uh, because it's a, it is a fairly complex tool. Uh, but we can go to the query and, and check again uh, what the, let's go here. And I don't know if it got updated now. Okay, plus, you know, you need to add plus uh, five hours. Um, so yeah, so you can see that uh, the, uh, uh, the BigQuery entry got updated. Okay, so so that's the um, so we so although there were a lot of minor micro I guess minor steps, uh, what we did is basically do a cron job uh, locally, cron job 
and essentially cron job with Kubernetes via the YAML files, and, and then again schedule our uh, uh, recommend pipeline using Airflow. Okay, we'll schedule it on local machine, but uh, you can imagine doing the doing that on external servers. And uh, uh, what we are not going to cover here is to do that in conjunction with Kubernetes, uh, so that uh, uh, jobs don't have to be on single machines, right? Uh, so, um, so but we'll, we'll not cover that here. Okay, so let's go back to our notes and see if there's anything uh, else that we missed. Yeah, so we actually ran, ran this, this command and, and the task is successful. So we checked on BigQuery as well that we, the uh, predictions were updated. So uh, as I said, if there are more tasks, you have to do a little bit more code, uh, like a couple of more lines. Basically, what is the upstream task? And what is the, you know, if you, if you specify task dependencies, then they will be run, they will be queued in that order, okay? Uh, and you can also define retries, so if a task upstream task doesn't get completed and the, uh, or it fails, then the downstream task can retry itself, you know, after a certain set period and all that. Okay. And instead of bash operator, we could have used another operator called Docker operator, which is specialized to Docker and deploying Docker containers, but we didn't do, we didn't do that here. And that's a good exercise to do that. Um, uh, and, and we are not going to do um, uh, Kubernetes plus Airflow uh, for today, uh, but it's something that you can look into. Okay, and finally, we lot, there's also a uh, deploy managed solution, just like many of the other solutions, just like GKA is a managed, managed solution for Kubernetes uh, uh, that you can self uh, host as well. Uh, so for Airflow, there's on the Google Cloud side, uh, there's a, a service called uh, Cloud Composer. So you can use Google Cloud Composer uh, to achieve the same type of scheduling and, and uh, workflow management. Um, so let me, uh, just comment on a few exercise, uh, uh, exercises that you could do. Uh, first is uh, generalize the data fetching uh, from the uh, workflow to an external URL that changes the data. So, so you can imagine uh, having a, you know, having a, like for example, an EC2 uh, instance exposed on with a, with a plus server, which keeps uh, adding this movie lens, you know, like keeps revealing only part of the movie lens data every day and, 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 uh, then you will be fetching more data and your recommendations would change as a function of time. Okay. Uh, so you will be fetching new and new, newer and newer data over time. Uh, you can change the package uh, pandas Google BigQuery to directly Google BigQuery. Uh, I've not done that, but uh, uh, that's a good uh, exercise to do so. Um, because both can do the same thing uh, to dump uh, your local data to uh, BigQuery, uh, among other things. Um, so there was this recommendation when, if you recall, I think in the last lecture, I said that uh, when I read from BigQuery, uh, that field uh, that I had where there was 10 recommendations, that becomes a string, okay? Uh, and if it becomes a string, it's difficult to parse. So can you, re re, I guess, refactor the code so that it's not a string, you know, the recommendations are not string, but maybe one recommendation per column, okay, in the, in the data frame. Um, and you can look at cron job, uh, you know, related uh, examples from Kubernetes web page. Um, uh, you can go through the tutorial on cron at, at this link. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a full, uh, I guess, uh, nice tutorial on Google's website itself on using BigQuery plus Python. And finally, Google Cloud Composer is a is essentially the same thing, but you'll see it on Google's uh, uh, UI where you can define tasks uh, using the UI, uh, so define DAGs using the UI uh, to schedule your tasks. So any questions at this point um, before we get to today's lecture, <laughs> today's content? Okay, if not, let's take a, five, uh, a 10 minute break. Uh, at, uh, let's assume at eight or three. Uh, we'll switch over to uh, Spark and Spark ecosystem. Okay, let's uh, restart. So good. So it's uh, actually it's good to good. Uh, let's let's pick the uh, next topic, uh, which is uh, the Spark ecosystem. So basically, we're going to look at uh, uh, you know large data. Uh, 
uh, related uh, 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 machine learning tasks, especially training. Uh, and then we'll look at PySpark uh, because we kind of have been using Python throughout. So we'll look at PySpark and PySpark based uh, data frame manipulation and you know how it's related to Pandas based data frames and so on. And then we'll look at one example of using MLlib based recommendation system. So recommendation system has been our go-to model training as well as our deployment uh, 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 task, uh, de deployment example. So we're gonna look at that. Um, in the meantime, if you have any questions about the previous uh, part, um, ask away on, on chat or on, on, on Slack. Um, uh, and so let me start with Spark, okay? So, so, so many of you uh, might have heard of Spark and some of you might have taken it uh, as part of uh, uh, some of your other courses, but here the focus is to really uh, come from the perspective of uh, management of uh, the machine learning lifecycle, in particular the training, uh, uh, you know, pipeline as well as the uh, deployment pipeline. So let's see, um, Spark. So Spark is basically a, uh, a program that lets you run data related tasks, uh, uh, which, which are quite uh, broad, uh, all the way from pre-processing to feature engineering to training. And the key uh, feature is that it lets you run these tasks on multiple underlying machines, okay? So the core idea uh, behind Spark uh, uh, is the notion of uh, resilient distributed data sets. So your data set, uh, if you have a large tabular data set, you can uh, work or process it uh, by working uh, on parts of it. And these parts are distributed across your machines, okay? Uh, and uh, the nice thing about Spark is that, again, it's a Kubernetes style, a cluster type of setup where if one node which had uh, data fails uh, for some reason, uh, you can still complete or finish your, your, your job, your data processing job. Uh, so uh, Spark has an abstraction called a data frame, very similar to Pandas and uh, uh, R, and that's actually, actually what we're gonna look at uh, towards the second half of this uh, section. And uh, these data frames sit on top of these underlying atomic, uh, I guess, underlying core units, uh, resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs, uh, and allow for a more approachable, you know, like uh, handling of our, you know, higher level data, you know, data um, task, okay, uh, some analytics workflow. So, uh, so as the name implies, the distributed in the name uh, basically allows for us to work with data volumes which are much, much larger than what can fit in a single machine. So for example, uh, if you have a 16 gig RAM machine or even a you know, 128 gig RAM machine, there is only so much data that can fit there, right? So, and this is not at the level uh, of a large organization. So a large organization you know, uh, may have lots and lots of uh, data uh, maybe event data from maybe they have an app product, maybe event data. So these things uh, really scale up uh, very quickly and, and they're very large. So you want to go beyond that. Okay, so then that's the situation uh, we are talking about. Uh, and uh, Spark in general has been quite popular in many industries and, and lots of companies. And you can think of it as a successor uh, to Hadoop and MapReduce systems uh, uh, from, from before. Okay. So what's PySpark? Uh, so PySpark is a way to access Spark using Python. Uh, and uh, as much of the work in machine learning world is in, in Python with you know, most of the deep learning going on with um, uh, you know, PyTorch and TensorFlow or uh, most of the uh, you know, uh, uh, tabular machine learning going on with uh, Pandas and stats models and scikit-learn and so on. Uh, so uh, it's, it allows for a seamless integration with uh, accessing this distributed data processing capability. And, uh, and, and, the, and, the, and the very good thing is that uh, you can achieve scale without a lot of engineering effort. So you can, if you imagine doing the same thing um, without the existence of Spark or Spark-like technologies, it would be a lot of, lot of engineering uh, and it would detract one from actually doing the analytics uh, project or analytics tasks themselves. Okay? You would need a lot more manpower. So what's the difference between Spark and container-based deployments? Uh, so we've looked at both hosted and managed deployments uh, of model training and serving via containerization, basically using Docker-based uh, containerization. Uh, and we also looked at serverless techniques. We've looked at Kubernetes for container orchestration. We've looked at Airflow for workflow management and so on. So there are so many tools we've looked at. 
but containers uh, inherently have to live in, for example, in the Kubernetes setting, have to live in the same uh, uh, node or the same machine, uh, you know, the uh, same machine. So there is really, uh, they cannot spread uh, their, their compute uh, or data processing across multiple machines, okay? And that's where uh, uh, Spark comes in and it allows us to work uh, on data uh, that can be spread across multiple machines and, and we can do training, we can do uh, ETL uh, 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 jobs and so on uh, across uh, multiple machines on really large volumes of data. Okay, uh, so this is, a, this is the advantage. Uh, there are other systems which also let you do that, but we'll primarily focus on Spark. So what's our goal for this section? Uh, we'll go through the basics of why Spark uh, data frames, uh, also a little bit about Spark clusters. Uh, we will, uh, if we, if we have time, we'll look at Pandas uh, user-defined functions, which let us uh, kind of import all the things that we uh, do in regular Python. Uh, we can push them onto each, uh, I guess, each individual machine and work on part of data by itself. Okay, so that's quite a, a strong feature. Uh, if we have time, we'll, we'll try to look at that. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll look at, so essentially we'll look at how to use PySpark uh, on the cloud. Uh, and in particular, we'll, we'll, we'll use uh, Databricks, which is a big vendor for Spark, uh, to, to, to try our hands on Spark. So let's actually get to uh, Spark clusters. So, so just like Kubernetes uh, you know, manages a cluster, uh, Spark, uh, there's also an underlying notion of a cluster. So the execution environment is, uh, execution environment just means you know, where does all this data processing training happen? So, okay, so this environment is actually just, if you physically look at it, it's, just, it's a bunch of machines, okay? That's the cluster. And uh, we submit jobs uh, to this cluster for execution. So jobs are, are essentially Spark jobs, uh, that's what they're called. Uh, Spark itself is a program which uh, manages this allocation of jobs to different machines in the cluster to work with data uh, and, and uh, accomplish the task in a distributed fashion at scale. Uh, it itself is written in a scalar uh, slash Java, uh, but uh, the Python interface uh, will make it amenable for us you know, to work with it uh, in an in a easier way. So there are many types of deployment. Uh, so this part of the text is a little bit, uh, the indenting did not work. Uh, I'll slightly change it after this uh, session. But there are three types of deployment, self-hosted. So you can now just host a Spark cluster yourself on a bunch of machines that you own locally on premises. You can also use directly uh, cloud vendors. You can create a cluster using basically EC2 instances or uh, 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 from uh, Google Cloud uh, computer instances. You can also have uh, there are explicit cloud uh, managed uh, solutions, uh, cloud uh, data proc by Google and uh, and and Elastic MapReduce by uh, AWS. Okay, but there's also another set of uh, deployments uh, which are. Uh, vendor-based deployments. So here's one prominent example is Databricks. So vendors, these vendors sit on top of uh, these infrastructure providers, infrastructure service providers like uh, Google Cloud and AWS and Azure and, and give an additional value add. Okay, so they're basically a thin layer uh, from which you can administer Spark clusters and, and submit jobs and so on, uh, but they sit and actually use resources which are AWS resources or Google Cloud resources to achieve your cluster and, and uh, make your cluster function the way you want it to. Uh, so they provide additional value as well. For example, uh, they can, you know, bundle in visualization or the cluster management or, you know, permissions management and the many, many things that, that you want to do uh, when you have, you know, such a, a computer environment. So uh, which one you choose depends on cost and benefits. For example, the vendor-based and cloud-based solutions, of course, will be uh, expensive, uh, but uh, self-hosted ones, will need uh, you know some you know dedicated uh, resources for to uh, to maintain the the cluster right so those are the considerations that you would need to make uh, when you're on a project okay so so what's the cluster itself it's a collection of machines uh, each machine uh, so uh, among the cluster one one of the machines is called a driver it's essentially the same as like the master in the kubernetes world uh, and the other machines are called workers and tasks are uh, des designed to be distributed across these worker nodes, okay, ideally. So that's where you would uh, kind of make use of this distributed uh, nature of computation. Uh, 
uh, if you do all your computation on the driver node, the, the node, uh, then you're really not exploiting the distributed nature. Okay, and I'm gonna revisit this point a couple of times uh, later on. Uh, so these nodes, these worker nodes are susceptible to failure. So for example, uh, here is an example actually of a failure. So, uh, so, so, not, so right below, um, so right below here is a screenshot where uh, there are four entries in this table. So you can see the entries are uh, going from uh, some you know, 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. and so on. So you can see uh, there's some cluster being resized from nine nodes to two workers. And then suddenly uh, there's a nodes lo lost log, which just means that a cluster lost at least one node. Uh, so there was a spot termination. So it seems like this cluster was running on AWS um, let's say, you know, was probably run, running on AWS and uh, one of the nodes was actually a spot instance and it got terminated. Okay. And so the cluster is again resizing itself to uh, the two uh, worker nodes uh, setting. Okay, so, so instances are uh, susceptible to failure. And so if you can imagine if, uh, if a task was running, uh, if a, yeah, a compute job was running and one of the nodes is gone, uh, then you should still be able to recover, right? So that's uh, something uh, that Spark uh, allows us to do. Uh, and because of the transient nature of nodes and a task maps to map to these nodes, the data IO needs to be handled in a very different way than with a single machine. In a single machine, uh, they would just read and write from disk, right? But here the machines can fail, uh, but we've already seen many ways to uh, work uh, uh, with this type of ephemeral or uh, not so reliable uh, local storage. In particular, we've been relying on very, uh, you know, uh, industry standard uh, storage uh, storage uh, solutions like S3 or Google Storage or uh, a BigQuery and so on. So, uh, so that's something that you need to really uh, bring into the picture because the cluster itself, uh, you know, is really you know operates in a setting where faults can happen. Uh, uh, and so you would not uh, as a such into like a much individual worker node in the, in the Spark. Uh, cluster to uh, you know assess bugs in your program, so it's actually uh, the mode of operation is different. Okay, um, so let's uh, and we'll see an example of how to uh, look at Spark uh, cluster monitoring and uh, health, you know, like checking the health of the cluster and so on in an example uh, in the next you know in the next few minutes. So uh, PySpark versus Python. So why you know we, we've already we already been doing training, data fetching, and uh, um, you know, sending the data predictions back to as, you know, a storage location, everything in Python. So why PySpark? So PySpark basically maps, uh, as I said earlier, maps a data frame uh, object to an underlying uh, RDD object in Spark. So, it, it, and, and because we have a data frame uh, 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 object, uh, we can actually really work with large data sets without uh, as seamlessly as we are using, as if we are using like a Pandas data frame. Okay, so uh, the key thing about Spark data frames versus regular, let's say, Pandas data frames is that uh, uh, changes to the data frame. For example, if you drop a column, and we'll see things like this, uh, we'll drop a column, or if you filter on uh, some condition and so on, they are not executed. They are not executed uh, when you run the command. Okay, they only executed when you want to see the results somewhere, maybe via uh, via like a display or a writing to disk uh, type of a. Uh, um, command. Okay, so unlike pandas, in pandas, if you drop uh, like a column or if you um, do some select operation or, or um, uh, do something else, then uh, the 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 execution is eager, so it immediately changes or immediately drops, for example, the column. Okay, uh, so this is a big difference between uh, pandas data frame and the Spark data frame, and uh, and this lazy execution is is good because uh, uh, it basically uh, uh, waits till all uh, all the computations that you want to perform. Uh, as long as you stick to the Spark data frame, uh, you know, uh, set of operations, and then potentially optimizes for these computations so that uh, the computations can happen in a really optimized way across multiple machines on large on, on large uh, data. Uh, so on large amount of data. Okay. So so when you work in pure Python, so let's say you're in a Spark environment and you you have a Spark job. But if you don't work with Spark data frames, but you work with, let's say, regular Python, uh, you know, Pandas, Pandas data frames, then those uh, data frames, uh, you know, whatever manipulation you're doing, are actually running only on the driver, okay, only on one machine of this whole cluster, okay. And so you're limited by the memory size of the single machine. You're limited by the compute available, maybe four cores, eight cores, 
uh, sorry, eight cores uh, on a single machine and so on. So this is suboptimal. So you want to stick with uh, uh, Spark data frames or Spark capability, uh, especially when working with large data. Of course, if you're working with small data, it really doesn't matter whether you're work, uh, working with Spark frames or uh, Pandas data frame. In fact, Pandas may be faster uh, because of lesser abstraction and lesser, you know, uh, 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 lesser uh, complexity. Okay. So, uh, so the in fact, uh, the most challenging aspect of working with uh, PySpark is to figure out which steps. Are, are your bottleneck steps and can you know are, cannot be get cannot be distributed or cannot uh, get you know are not getting distributed the way you've written it currently and then refactor it so that it can get distributed okay and that's where pandas uh, udf or user defined functions can help us okay um, and and it, this is a, so finally a tip uh, is that you always need to work with subsample uh, of data always uh, not just for spark setting but also in your regular single machine uh, 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 analytics projects, you should work with some sample data, get all these steps, uh, you know, uh, uh, properly done and hopefully optimize for time and then run it on the full, uh, full data set. Okay, so with that, let's actually jump on to uh, Spark on Databricks. So Databricks is a particular vendor, uh, right? So we're going to do some hands-on uh, activity with Spark here. So Databricks allows uh, organizations to uh, run spark jobs okay and integrates well with all the major you know not all but like uh, quite a few uh, cloud vendors so aws azure google cloud and so on uh, what we'll do is we'll use the their community edition to learn more about uh, spark uh, and work with spark uh, based clusters uh, so their community edition is hosted on aws so so what is uh, uh, the uh, the community edition basically uh, users have access to a 15 GB cluster, so it's just the storage space, uh, a cluster manager, and a notebook environment. So you'll see that it's essentially going to be like a Jupyter notebook uh, environment. Uh, so you can prototype simple applications and also uh, some uh, database access uh, uh, related uh, uh, parts are also available in this community edition. Uh, and there is no time limits uh, and, and there is no cost. Okay, so that's a good thing. So if you run a Spark cluster on AWS directly, of course, you're going to you've been consuming compute resources uh, which are which will may incur you know which, which will incur so you you can skip that if you use the community edition just to get used to or get get a sense of what spark is okay so uh, create an account here so let's actually open that um, okay so database community edition um, let's uh, yeah, so let's create, let's log in there. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, what's the, uh, so you can, you know, you can see the differences between community edition and, and uh, regular edition. So regular edition is actually geared towards, uh, you know, can change the underlying platform from Azure or AWS, uh, can also do uh, many, many things, okay? So many uh, large companies do, you know, do tend to use these types of vendors, not just Databricks, but others uh, to, uh, to manage their, um, large data processing requirements. Okay, so with that, let's actually uh, log in. So let me see. Um, Okay, let's sign in. Let's set the password. Okay, so here you'll see an uh, interface like this. Um, so most of the activity happens on the left hand side where you can see a lot of uh, uh, icons there. Uh, so common tasks are you know, working with the notebook. It's like a Jupyter notebook, uh, essentially. Uh, creating tables, uh, which I guess Databricks calls in, uh, Databricks tables, uh, creating cluster, creating a job. So jobs, uh, you know, just like before we saw, these are jobs just mean they, they can be scheduled and so on. And uh, they also have integration with uh, MLflow. So MLflow is like uh, Airflow in terms of managing machine learning, uh, machine learning uh, jobs um, and, and a few other things. So that's good. So let's actually, uh,
yeah let's start creating a cluster so let's click a cluster and then uh, create cluster so recommendation so i'm just going to give a name recommendation cluster okay and so there's this uh, uh, choice of a runtime version okay runtime version is basically what's what all software do you want available on on this on this cluster okay all the nodes all the worker nodes and the driver will have the same type of software so it basically scala and spark for example but if you scroll down you'll see there are so many runtimes so there's a the machine learning runtime so ml runtime will uh, automatically have tensorflow installed for example or you know pytorch installed and, and so on. So it's your choice. It depends on the rest of your system uh, requirements. And there are also versions which will support GPU and so on. So let's just uh, pick something. And, uh, and since the community edition, we don't get many choices. You can also change some configurations that you, you if you need to change. Okay. Uh, so with that, Let's create the cluster. So here it shows how many workers there are. So in this community edition, there is zero workers and, uh, and one driver. So they're only providing a single machine um, cluster here, but it's just illustrate um, uh, illustration purposes, it, it's fine. Okay, um, so let's create a cluster. So you can see uh, here it says UI on JSON. So if you click on JSON, it, you have just like the YAML files that we're using with Kubernetes. Uh, this uh, you can work with uh, essentially dictionaries uh, to you know programmatically access and, and work with uh, Databricks clusters as well. So Spark clusters as well using command line. Uh, but we're not going to explore uh, that option. Um, so as the cluster is starting, uh, let's uh, so you can see the uh, uh, request for creation of cluster just now. And uh, I think what I wanted to focus on was, uh, uh, yeah, installation of libraries. So, so uh, we can install libraries uh, uh, on, on the cluster by just using the UI. It's useful to, you know, you can do it also using the notebook. If you recall on Jupyter or on Google Colab, you can do a dollar pip install something, right? So uh, you can run, uh, what I mean is you can run terminal commands. So similarly, you can run the same thing here. You'll see, we'll see the notebooks in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, but we can install uh, new, you know, uh, arbitrary things like, uh, so let's install, So surprise is the library that we were using uh, in the first section, right? Uh, to create a recommendation uh, system. So we can install that. So uh, from PyPy and um, uh, it's getting, it's, it's pending installation. Okay. So uh, there's a Spark BigQuery package uh, that uh, we, we need to install, uh, but uh, let's uh, wait for the cluster to start and, and try out the notebook and then we can install that. Uh, in the meantime, are there any questions about uh, the Spark ecosystem, differences between Spark data frame and, and Pandas uh, in terms of execution? One is uh, lazy execution versus the other one is uh, early execution. So let's see the event log uh, creating. If not, we'll uh, jump over to the notebooks in a, in a second once this cluster starts. Okay. Um, okay, it's taking some time. <laughs> um, okay, actually we can start a notebook uh, directly. So uh, for that, we can just go to workspace uh, go to users, go to your username. And uh, I already have a bunch of notebooks from before. So let me start with the basics uh, notebook. Okay. Uh,
Okay, uh, any notebook is fine. So let's uh, 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 let's uh, see if the cluster is started. Okay, it's still setting up the node. Okay. So let's go to workspace and uh, actually create a notebook. So you can create a notebook, you know, like this. Um, temporary notebook. And it tells you, you know, whether, whether you want Python or actually you can use other things, Scala, SQL, and R. Uh, just like PySpark, there's a uh, ways to uh, um, access uh, the Spark distributed computing capability using these other environments as well, other languages as well. So let's create a temporary notebook. Okay, let's see if the cluster has started, it has not yet started. Okay. So um, uh, notebooks are basically very similar to uh, collab notebooks. So notebooks are where you can run your uh, uh, ML scripts. So um, uh, as, as I said uh, earlier, we chose some runtime and, and it comes, uh, so the choice of the runtime uh, allows for, uh, let's us have some pre-installed uh, Python uh, libraries. For example, as I said, if you use if you choose ML, then uh, TensorFlow and, and uh, uh, Pandas is already present uh, in in the uh, in the uh, runtime. Okay, so let's see. Is it? Well, it's still taking a lot of time. Okay, so we, we have to attach to a cluster, so let's attach anyway. Uh, it's still, uh, it hasn't, the cluster has not been initiated yet. Um, so, okay, so what we're trying to do now is to try to install, so try to uh, get data from uh, big, um, okay, try to get, try to create data uh, so that, uh, try to set up data on a remote location. As I said, Spark clusters by themselves, uh, the storage part is, uh, you know, essentially not reliable. Uh, so we'll have to somehow pair it, pair up the cluster with a uh, external storage location like S3 or uh, in our case, we'll use, um, uh, <laughs> in our case, we'll actually use S3. So, but you can use S3 or Google, Google Cloud Storage or um, BigQuery or something like that. So, um, so, we'll, uh, so to use S3, uh, we just have to, uh, um, uh, set up the permissions uh, properly. So before that, we will we'll actually uh, uh, prepare our, our data. So uh, let's actually, okay, the cluster is uh, uh, prepared. So let's go back here. Yeah, so uh, as I said, you can use uh, pip install uh, to install, but let's go back to, uh, we'll come back to this uh, big, um, uh, BigQuery installation uh, later if needed. Uh, yeah, so we we have we are in the state where the cluster is running, and uh, uh, and and we have opened a notebook. Okay, so so now we are we are trying to get the data. So we want to get the data in a in a in a place where we can easily uh, uh, request it and and get it onto our cluster. So. We're going to use uh, AWS S3, uh, but any other choice is fine as well. Um, so in fact, uh, you can upload the data directly. Uh, I think if you go to home, uh, import and explore data. So if I click here, you can actually just um, upload the data from your, from your browser. Um, and you can also change um, you know, sources for uh, data sets. But let's uh, do it uh, the way we have specified in the uh, section. So. Uh, 
Okay, so for that, uh, let's uh, prepare the data. So if you, uh, okay, Apache Airflow is still running. Uh, okay, so there was a task, I, I think this was the uh, tutorial task that finished. Uh, so let's clear this. So we are in the Airflow directory. Uh, so when we ran surprise lib, uh, so when we, when we ran our first uh, uh, model training, uh, um, in, in the first section, when we were trying to train a surprise lib based um, SVD or a matrix factorization based model, uh, then it downloaded the, the movie lens data. So, uh, so it, it downloaded the data uh, if you run that training locally, and it would have kept it in a folder called dot, dot surprise data. So, if it's not there, you can go back and uh, run a surprise lib uh, based training and it'll dump the movie lens. So, the fetch movie lens uh, function or command essentially dumps the data here. Oh, sorry, sorry, not fetch movie lens, but um, load built in data. I think uh, uh, I can let me go, let me show you that. Um, yeah, if we go to lecture one and uh, go to this training. So if you look at this, uh, there's this function call. Uh, called uh, data, data set load built in. Okay, so when, when this function is executed, in fact, it'll ask you, do I wanna download data if you're running it for the first time? And, and then it'll download uh, data into that location. So let me uh, go back to that. Um, actually, we can terminate this exit. Uh, yeah, so in the surprise data location. So let's go in there. So, oops. Okay, there is no uh, data. Okay, so let's actually go here and uh, run. Uh, Uh, <laughs> these two lines. Can you open this? Okay. So, so if we just run this too, and I think it should ask uh, if you've done it for the first time. Um, okay, it downloaded it. Now, let me actually close this, save the page. Let me save this and close it. Okay, so we don't need this either. Exit, okay. So if, if we now look at the folder, we have M movie lens 100K. So um, so there's a lot of files, okay? If, but if you look at the readme, uh, then you will see that uh, the files have a certain you know, logic there. So forget about the U1, U2, U3, U4, they're just splits of the data. So the data that we care about is u.data and uh, uh, u.item. Okay, so let's look at uh, u dot um, data. Not less, but let's say do add u dot uh, data. So you can see that this is the data that uh, we've been seeing before. It's basically a user ID, an item ID, the rating of the user, and uh, timestamp. Okay, and uh, if you look at u dot item, it's basically uh, it's it's a uh, it's a bunch of uh, movie metadata. So movie ID, or movie ID, movie name, sorry, movie name. Uh, I think it's a release date and, and some link to the IMDB uh, website and, and various other things. I don't want to open this. Uh, okay, so we have that. So what we will do is try to push this data onto uh, S3, okay? And uh, I am not gonna repeat those steps. Uh, Uh, okay, maybe I should. So let's see. <laughs> so, 
So what we'll do is, uh, so if you look at this, um, uh, so this u.data uh, 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 file, it doesn't have a header, so we're gonna create a header. So let me move this u.data to u.data, uh, no header. And, uh, and then let me create a file uh, using vim u.data uh, with user ID, item ID, and uh, rating and timestamp. Okay. It's just a convenience uh, thing that I'm trying to do. And then we, we're gonna uh, append the u.data without the header to uh, u.data. I mean, this is not something you can do with large data sets, but this is something I, I thought I'll just add a header to this. So now if you look at head u dot um, data, uh, you have the um, uh, header. Actually, this is not good. Uh, let me actually, um, so in the header, I should have made it tab separated rather than a space a spacing uh, based. So let me, um, uh, Head data to you. So now, uh, okay, I don't think the first line even came, but it's okay. So UID, UID, uh, tab, uh, item ID, tab, uh, rating. Uh, sorry, rating tab uh, time step. So this is just to ensure the conformity with the rest of the data set that's tab separated. So now let me just go back and, and do this. And oops, sorry, I should not have done them. So you can see it's tab separated. Okay. Uh, so we have the data ready and uh, uh, also item. Uh, so we're gonna do so item has a lot of metadata. We don't, I, I don't want to see that. So let me uh, cut just the first and the second fields, uh, which are the uh, uh, movie ID and then the, then the uh, uh, movie name. Okay, so, so let me call it movies, um, movies underscore, I think I gave a name here. raw, movies underscore raw dot data file. Okay. So what, what, what is this command doing? So first of all, cat just means uh, read this whole file. Uh, perp means the piping uh, command. So it just means uh, read the file, but keep it in buffer so that the next command can act on it. So cut uh, minus field one comma two means uh, cut the first two fields. Okay, and I need to probably specify a separator here. Uh, yeah, I need to separate separator. So the separator in this file is uh, this uh, vertical line. Okay, so pick the first two fields and then dump it into movie dot uh, movie underscore raw dot uh, dat file. Okay, so uh, okay, that's not correct. Uh, The illegal byte sequence. Mm. Okay, I am not sure, so let's see. Okay, so we do have the first two fields. Oh, okay, but there's some issue here. So I think. Uh, Okay, uh, let's not worry about this. This is just a uh, uh, quick uh, uh, example to show you how you can do metadata annotation in the command line as well. But uh, let's actually go to uh, uh, AWS and, 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 and see the, uh, and first create a S3 bucket. Uh, let's uh, do that. And that's the S3 bucket we'll try to access from uh, Databricks. Okay, so let's do that. Uh, 
Okay, so let's sign in. And let's go to S3. Okay, so you'll see that actually I, I created the same bucket earlier. So Databricks uh, hyphen Rexus. So you can actually manually create it. So you can do, click create bucket, give a name, uh, some name, and, and then just click next uh, on and on. Uh, okay, some name already exists. So Y94 maybe. And, and you don't have to change anything, but you can look at what these mean. Um, we don't need public access and create bucket. So once you create bucket, uh, uh, you can uh, dump uh, items into here uh, and you can do it uh, actually visually by just clicking upload and, and so on. Okay. So I've already done that. So I will not repeat the same. Uh, what did I upload? I uploaded the two files. Okay. One file is called uh, u.data that we just created. The other file is called movies underscore raw dot data. So we didn't have to do this. We could have just, um, we could have uploaded u dot item, uh, but just to show, uh, show you that you can do some processing uh, of metadata offline. I just did this. Okay. But uh, so let's say there's a metadata file and the actual uh, data file of historical user movie ratings. Okay. Or historical user movie interactions. That's also fine. Okay. So let's say we have this. Now let's go back to our um, Airflow. No. So this is, uh, I think, Google Cloud uh, Composer. So let's go to, we don't need big flow, a uh, big query. Let's, um, yeah, let's close this. Uh, yeah, so instead of uploading file, let's go back to our workspace, uh, temp. Um, so what we'll do is uh, now set uh, the key and the, uh, uh, so we'll first set the AWS access key and secret key. Uh, for the time being, I'm gonna uh, paste these keys, but I'm gonna disable them very soon. So, um, you know, but you guys should use your own uh, keys here. So let's set the key. Okay, and and uh, on the uh, uh, in this section uh, in this section where we're creating the uh, Spark on Databricks, there's actually a, a elaborate uh, part on how to uh, get the bucket set up. So this is just screenshots of uh, how to set up the bucket. Uh, yes, 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 and then you just upload it. Uh, directly these two files. Okay, so we are here. And now what we can do is, uh, uh, as I said, there's a need for uh, uh, access key. So to programmatically access S3, right? So uh, we can go to IAM and uh, here uh, I'm just using model hyphen user. And that user, uh, if you look at the, the, that user already has permissions to access S3 as well as the Alexa container registry. So, uh, and then we can go into the uh, security tab and, and uh, look at uh, like we can we can click access uh, you know click uh, 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 create access key for example to get uh, get information okay uh, but you should not so the way I'm doing it here I'm showing it to you guys but you should generally uh, be very be very cautious about exposing your uh, at least the secret key um, uh, for sure uh, to public okay and so key management itself is a very important uh, aspect that we'll not be covering in this uh, course but uh, it's something that you should be aware of uh, password management and, and just key key management in an organization uh, will have its own uh, uh, you know details okay, so let's uh, move forward so uh, today what I'll do is just do a very basic pie spark or just get familiar with the notebook and we'll continue uh, continue more about PySpark, uh, Python data frames, uh, sorry, the Spark data frames and, uh, and uh, the differences with Pandas data frames in the, in the next session. Okay. So, uh, so we created this uh, notebook, it's called temp for now. Uh, it's just a Jupyter notebook, so we can do all sorts of things. Right, so let me, uh, for simplicity, uh, 
hide this code. Uh, and uh, so this is just for uh, in range 10 or three. No, uh, print uh, is uh, okay, uh, dot format. Hi. So you can you can do you know it's just a stupid notebook. That's what I wanted to show. Next, uh, let's look at uh, accessing the data. That's what we'll do today for today, and then uh, we'll continue on uh, with the uh, actual PySpark uh, details uh, soon. Okay. So to access the data, we already saved uh, two uh, environment. I mean, two uh, this um, uh, constants essentially or variables in this notebook. So uh, let's actually uh, give it to what is called the Spark cluster. Okay, so Spark cluster is uh, abbreviated here as SC. Uh, it's an environmental. It's it's already preloaded, so you can just have to you just have to tell uh, it to use this access key and the secret key that you have just saved here. Okay, you don't have to save the keys explicitly in this code. You can also save it to the cluster. Uh, in uh, and maybe I'll show it uh, when I go to the cluster page. Um, so here's one way to access uh, the uh, the cluster so so to access the data so so spark uh, has this uh, utility just like pandas pandas uh, read csv spark also has a way to read uh, data from a remote location so in this case uh, s3 location uh, is s3 and this is the name of my bucket so databricks uh, hyphen uh, rexus uh, and the data that i want to read is u dot data okay and the header is true because I added the header and separator is actually a tab separation in that uh, original data. And I've set infer schema is equal to true. Uh, you can actually explicitly say what's the column, what is its type, uh, but uh, we're not doing that here. And then I'm using a, so, okay, let me just do this. So this will execute, uh, uh, okay. It's, uh, it's, it's reading the data frame as a Spark data frame. Uh, so I can actually display the data frame uh, using the display command. Uh, so here you can see a sample of, you know, showing the, I guess the first uh, thousand rows. So, so this is how you'd access a data set. Okay, so this is using, so it's very easy. Once you set up the right permissions um, uh, and, and if you know the format and, and it's, and it's uh, you know schema and details like that but csv files are or in general these types of flat files simple files are not the right storage format for large data sets uh, so there's a different format called uh, parquet uh, parquet files uh, which are the format which makes sense for uh, uh, large uh, you know storing large data sets on in, in a distributed manner okay so we're going to discuss about file formats uh, next time uh, so so what we've accomplished so far is um, you know, get started with Databricks, started a cluster, started a notebook, uh, saved our uh, AWS, uh, you know, access and secret keys here, and uh, and then uh, access our data from from the uh, we did a read operation from there, and 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 this is the uh, Spark cluster. So so this is the Spark, uh, uh, this is the data set that we have. So if you look at uh, uh, type of this data frame. You can see that it is actually a, a Spark data frame. So, so since it's a Spark data frame, you can do a print um, uh, schema to see what the schema of this data frame is. Okay, so it's actually it's saying UID is an integer, ID is an integer, rating is an integer, and timestamp is also an integer. Okay, so. Uh, let's go back to display. Uh, so here actually we can plot, uh, so Databricks, so this is a value add, Databricks is adding on top of, you know, um, helping us manage a Spark cluster, is that you can do some visualization. So I clicked on uh, this, uh, you know, plot type of a command here, and I can actually click on plot options, and I can see, you know, I can manipulate just like, you know, you might, you might have seen this on uh, pivot tables or Tableau or other, other tools. So, for example, I can have uh, uh, keys being ratings and drop the IDs. And timestamp, instead of summing the timestamp, I can do a count of the timestamp. Timestamp is just uh, you know, now a proxy for ratings. So you can see 
uh, uh, like if I apply this, uh, confirm, uh, you can see, uh, yeah. So you can see uh, this this uh, very quickly. I could I could get a glimpse of uh, this data set, right? So how many ratings of the type one? Uh, so how many ratings got a rating of one? How many ratings got a uh, rating of two? So so this timestamp is irrelevant because I'm just counting the number of timestamps available or counting the number of rows essentially. Uh, so ratings of type three. So most uh, common rating has been rating of four, and and there are of course uh, ratings are skewed towards three, four, and five than to one and two. Okay. So that's a very quick uh, exploration of uh, this data set. Uh, so I think more explanation we're gonna do uh, next time. Um, so to summarize, we have, we, as I said earlier, uh, Spark is a great ecosystem for working with really large data. So data that doesn't fit in your, uh, in a single machine. So if you, uh, if some of you have done deep learning based uh, model training, uh, you've seen how disk-based access of you know batches is done, like uh, using data loaders and data sets. So, but there's still a single machine uh, execution of the training, right? Uh, but if you go back uh, and think about uh, uh, you know doing larger scale, uh, let's say distributed optimization, let's say a recommendation system, we have a users uh, who are in millions, and and then uh, items which are in millions, you can't really uh, even load that interaction matrix. So you know, doing any processing on top, on, on top of it is not going to be practical on a single machine, uh, in, in, you know, naively speaking. So uh, in, in such modeling situations, it's, it's, it Spark really shines. You can do distributed uh, uh, processing of the data. So that's, you know, using uh, Pandas UDS uh, as well as you know, directly using Spark, uh, you know, a lot of functions in Spark. And then you can uh, somehow condense the data to a manageable uh, state, or you, know, you can derive summary statistics directly. Uh, train models as well, or you can do some processing so as to get the data into a format where maybe your uh, algorithm needs a single machine uh, execution, then you can do that as well. So, so that's, this, that's the uh, benefit of Spark. Um, so try out Databricks um, today or this week. Uh, we're gonna resume uh, and, and the next time we'll just cover one key aspect of Databricks, which is uh, in addition to you know, Spark data frames, is going to be the use of MLlib library for our uh, recommendation problem. Okay, so we're going to do that uh, uh, next time and just compare it with uh, like uh, the the single machine versions that we had, like using surprise lib. Okay, so uh, uh, so we'll pause for today here. It's a good stopping point. So in the meantime, uh, are there any questions uh, uh, before we close? Okay, if there are no questions, uh, then uh, that's it for today. Uh, uh, I'll see you guys next time.